one who is giving tonight. Um, maybe there's some that really want to, and they don't have anything to give. And I pray that you would bless them as well. We thank you once again for carrying us through this last week. Um, many, a variety of different things that, that we had responsibilities for, things that we were involved in. And as we look back on it, we can see how you provided, how you cared for us. And now we thank you that as we give, that we are reminded once again that you are the one who has given us all things. And this, uh, our giving is just a, a response of love for what you mean to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, Danny, for that song about our Lord. It is interesting that he played that. And our next, our next uh, song is number 321, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness. That falling right before the Lord's Supper tonight uh, is a theme that, that God gave us as we go to remember what he's done for us. Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness. And uh, let's sing one, three, and four on that, if we can, please. You can remain seated. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my Oh. 
So tonight we are in the book of Daniel, and we are in chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 is a shift from what we have been looking at. Uh, the first six chapters uh, were dealing with Daniel being given the ability to interpret visions of Nebuchadnezzar with the giant statue image, and then the writing on the wall with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, with, with Belshazzar, excuse me. And then we had uh, the event where uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would worship, uh, would not worship the golden idol. And then we had Daniel not willing to worship uh, the king. And uh, so he was cast into the den of lions. So you had uh, all these different things that were taking place um, during the ministry life of Daniel. We come into chapter 7, and it, it has a very different feel. There is a shift, because beginning in chapter 7, we're looking at visions that God gave to Daniel himself. Um, like I said earlier, at the beginning of the book, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision, and God allowed Daniel to interpret that. Then you had Belshazzar with the writing on the wall, and Daniel interpreted that. Now God is giving visions to Daniel that are dealing with, there's some overlap with what has already taken place with Nebuchadnezzar, and then it goes into far more detail, and uh, it's, it's very involved. So what we're going to look at tonight is this first vision that God gives to Daniel. Now, let me just uh, kind of give you an overview of, of the rest of the book, just so that you can see this. In chapter 7, verse 1, if you'll look at it, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a vision and had visions of his head upon his bed and then wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So, notice, when does this take place? First year of Belshazzar. Now, which chapter, you're allowed to look, this is an open book test, um, <laughs> which chapter dealt with Belshazzar? Well, go ahead and look. What is it? Chapter 5. Okay, so we know that this vision is kind of tied to the timetable of chapter 5. Now, look in chapter 8. Let's just look ahead. Chapter 8, verse 1. It says, In the third year of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So he's going to have an additional vision. When is this one? What bracket does it fit into? That, that same chapter 5 the, of the history of Belshazzar. Okay? Then let's go to chapter 9. Chapter 9, it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the numbers of the years, whereof the Lord, word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayers and supplications uh, and it goes on to say that I prayed, and then the Lord is going to give him a vision also in chapter 9. And it fits during the time of Darius. Then go to chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, and the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So now he's going to have his fourth vision. It's going to take place in the third year of Cyrus. And then 
the fifth vision is chapters 11 and 12. It says, verse 1 of chapter 11, And I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I understood, I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer. And he is going to have this vision concerning uh, what is coming, and it's, it's chapters 11 and 12. So like I said, the first one were the wonderful stories that we grow up with in, in children's church and Sunday school that we dearly love, and it was so much fun to, to look at those uh, on these Sunday nights. Now we're moving into this second half of it, and it's all related to visions. It's related to things that have been and are coming. So, um, let's go back to chapter 7, because in chapter 7, um, verses 1 through 14, Daniel has a vision. In verses 15 through 28, God gave the interpretation of the vision. Now, here's what's interesting. This vision is going to have different animals uh, that represent the different kingdoms. But it parallels chapter 2 when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the image with the head of gold and the, the shoulders and the, the midsection of silver and, and then the trunk of bronze and then the legs and the feet were made out of, of uh, iron and clay. Remember all of that? Okay, what we're going to look at in chapter 7 is a vision that God gives to Daniel that parallels the same thing, only he uses different ways of, of uh, communicating it. So, I, I'm going to, um, let's see. This is the one that I showed you with chapter 2, okay? So, in chapter 2 had a head of gold, which was the kingdom of Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, which was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, the belly and the thigh of bronze was the kingdom of ancient Greece, the legs of iron were the kingdom of, of ancient Rome, the feet of iron and clay, we believe, is the kingdom of Rome that's going to be restored, that is coming in the future. And then remember at the end of that, there was this huge boulder that came in and crushed Rome, crushed the, the feet, and, and, and destroyed the image. And that was God doing that. Now, um, well, let's see if we can make this do what it's supposed to. There we go. Here is a, a different way of showing you what we're going to see in the next few chapters, okay? So, over here, um, I, think, I think if I would turn it on <laughs> would help. No wonder I'm clicking, and finally the guy's do it for me over there, okay. All right, so in chapter two, um, you had the head of gold, which was Babylon, the, the uh, arms of Medo-Persian was silver, brass for Greece, the iron was Rome, uh, the iron and clay is, we're simply calling, don't, don't worry about all of this, this is the, the later Rome. Um, I, I borrow some of these and, and the, their terminologies. Then God smashes that, and what we're going to see, uh, and that is judgment. And then the stone fills the whole earth, and that's Christ's kingdom. What we're going to look at tonight, this is going to parallel, Daniel 7 is going to parallel what we've looked here. It's going to talk about Babylon, Medo-Persian, the Greek, Rome, uh, Rome later, the judgment that's going to come, and then we're going to see Christ's kingdom again. And then, I'm just letting you in on it, when we get to chapter 8, we're going to have other ways of describing this, 
Uh, Babylon is not mentioned, but we're going to have a ram with two horns, and it's going to be talking about the Medo-Persian, then the he-goat, it's going to be talking about Greece, and then there's a little horn that comes out of four horns, and that's dealing with Rome, and then we're going to see that God's going to bring judgment on all of that. So this is what we're going to look at tonight. So let's go to chapter 7, and let's get into this. It says... Verse 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. So it's, it's like in his vision, the sea gets, begins to churn and stir. And, and verse 3 says, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. So here's the first one that you saw, as we see Babylon is represented with the lion's head there, only this is not any lion. As verse 4 says, it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and it was made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. All right. So, um, again, uh, the timing of this, Daniel had this vision in the first year, going back to verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So that's when this vision happened. So it was, when we picture Belshazzar, we picture right at the end of his reign, when there was the writing on the wall and... and uh, uh, he was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. But to give you, if you just want a point of reference of the timing of this, this is about nine years after Nebuchadnezzar dies. And so it's about 52 years since Nebuchadnezzar had his vision. So, if that helps you, when Daniel has this vision that, that parallels Nebuchadnezzar's, there's a 50-year gap between those two visions, but they're going to be very similar in what they deal with. So having, having said that, um, uh, let's look at this again. In verse 4, we've got this beast, and it's a lion with the wings of an eagle. And it tells us that, in verse 4, the wings get plucked. The wings are torn off. And then it stands up on two feet like a human, and it's given the mind of a human. Well, when you think of the story that we know of Babylon, and what we know in the first four chapters, um, what does that remind you of? when it talks about those things. It reminds me of, of the majesty and authority that Nebuchadnezzar had in his reign over the empire of Babylon. Uh, when it talks about him standing on, the lion stands on his feet, it's given, uh, it becomes like a human and it's given the mind of a human. Does that remind you of anything related to Nebuchadnezzar? Remember chapter 4, when, when uh, his mind is restored to him, and for the first time, we're going to use the term, he really becomes a human in that he acknowledges in his thinking God, and he worships God. Um, ultimately, uh, under Belshazzar, uh, the eagle's wings are torn off, and Babylon comes to an end. Now, here's where we just have to be careful. Uh, you say, well, were the, are the wings torn off uh, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar? And then he's got the clear mind. Um, how, are, how do we put these in order? And I'm just saying, let's, we'll just be careful with it at first. Um, but it's clearly talking about Babylon. Babylon. We're going we're gonna to see that in just a little bit. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, it says, and Behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and it raised up itself on one side. And it had three ribs 
in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arrive, Arise, devour much flesh. So this beast is a bear, and it's raised up on one side, and it has three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it's instructed to eat flesh, to eat a lot, to tear things up. And this bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire. So we see that here. You see the bear? It's, it's got the three uh, in its mouth. And um, of course, the Medo Persian Empire succeeded the, imp- the Babylonian Empire. And in this partnership of the Medes and the Persians, notice how did it word it? Um, a bear, it raised up itself on one side. And what we believe that means is that it was the Medes and the Persians, but the Persians dominated the relationship between the Medes and the Persians. And so we think that's what it means when it says it was raised up on one side. The Persians were the stronger of the two. And again, we're speculating, but we believe that the three ribs represent their three greatest military conquests. In other words, during the, the control of the, the Medes and the Persians being in control of the world, their biggest conquests were what would be number one? Babylon. Yes, that's what we read about. It would also include Egypt and it would also include Syria. So um, the the slow-moving but crushing armies of the Medo-Persian Empire were very well known, and they would simply overwhelm their opponents with superior size and strength. And as uh, H.A. Ironside, the, the great preacher from many years ago, Uh, when you have this statement, arise and devour flesh, this command to arise and devour much flesh indicates the extreme cruelties often practiced by the Persians and and the wide extent of their conquests. So that is the bear. Now look at verse 6. It says, after this I beheld and lo, like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So, uh, for Nebuchadnezzar's vision, uh, this would be the part that was the waist that was brass, and, but Greece is, is uh, described as a leopard, that has four heads on it. Now, if you know history, uh, that would, uh, you would understand that. First of all, um, great authority was given to it, and it had four wings on it. The wings would represent the speed at which it conquered others. Who was the original leader of of, of Greece, Alexander the Great. And if you remember, he moved very swiftly through the known world. Uh, he conquered the civilized world. Um, at age 28, um, nothing in the history of the world was equal to the conquests of Alexander, who ran through all the countries in 12 years. And uh, many of you know that at the age of 33, he sat down and cried because there wasn't anything else to do. He had already accomplished everything he wanted. So that would fit uh, what we have in verse 6, a leopard upon which the back of it, there were four wings of a fowl. So uh, under Alexander the Great, they, they made great conquests. But notice now, it also had four heads and dominion was given to it. 
And many of you know, when Alexander the Great died, his, his uh, uh, kingdom was divided into what? Four. Um, and so it had four heads. Uh, you had Cassander, uh, Lysimachus, uh, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And so we know that those four are the ones who uh, the divided up uh, Greece and, and their domain throughout the world. Now, let's look at verses 7 and 8. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." So this is a beast that is unidentified. It's just that it was different than the other ones. The other ones were pictured with uh, animals that we could relate to. A lion, a bear, a leopard. But this one is different. And it's not like anything else. And it's very frightening to see, very uh, dreadful, verse 7 describes it as such. But notice, its teeth had what? Had iron. So you, you're beginning to see we've, we've, we've got this, this second part of, of uh, uh, you, we've got Rome here where iron is tied into it and then how many horns? Ten. Uh, what was true of down here? You had the feet, and obviously, how many toes do you have? You've got ten. So again, you see this, this parallel between the visions, though that it is described very, very differently. And so this animal has large iron teeth. It crushes and devours its victims and tramples uh, anything that's left over. But if you'll look at verse 8, and it says, And I considered the horns, those ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So there's the ten horns, and yet another one called a little horn comes up, and though it's identified as a little horn, it takes out three of the ten, plucks them up by the root, verse 8 says, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a man speaking great things. And so we've got this uh, little horn, but it's got eyes like a human, and a mouth that speaks, and it speaks great things. It speaks very boastfully. Now, here's the, here's the thing. In history, we don't have anything that quite aligns with that yet. And there are those that, that take this and say, well, it was fulfilled in the past, and um, it was uh, simply, uh, it, it represents, they, they spiritualize it. And we're going to talk about that later. The reason we don't is because this whole thing of a specific number, 10, shows up here. Um, it, it showed up in chapter 2, it showed up in chapter 7, and I just want to tell you, it also shows up in the book of Revelation. And and it just keeps coming back that, that we're looking at it and going, boy, just to spiritualize that and to make it something we don't know what, um, we're a little uneasy about that. And that's why we believe this is something that is going to come in the future. And we will deal with those things. Now, let's go to verse 9. 
It says, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down. All of this is going to be taken down. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head was the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Who do you think we're talking about? We're talking about God. And if you've been here on Sunday nights from a couple years ago, when we studied the book of Ezekiel, his wheels as burning fire, does that sort of ring a bell? When we studied that? Yeah. Notice verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So here we're talking about God and the fact that a judgment is coming. And so this too parallels that you had the stone in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, the stone not made with hands, comes and smashes uh, the, the image and it's crushed and then the stone fills the whole earth. Well, the stone being cru crushing these fits what we're reading here is this judgment that is going to fall on all of the kingdoms of the earth and uh, God is going to, to set up his kingdom eventually. So um, we've, we've got God being described here. His clothing was white as snow, his hair was white as wool, his throne was a flaming fire, uh, the wheels were all ablaze, there was a river of fire flowing out from before him, and we've got just thousands upon thousands are tending, attending to God and it's like a court setting. And the books are opened. And notice what happens in verses 11 and 12. It says, I beheld then, because the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So eventually, all of them are going to be taken down. They're all going to be destroyed. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So we've got here the imagery of God the Father and God the Son. The, the, um, uh, the Son of Man is a reference to Jesus Christ. The uh, terminology, Son of Man, that is a term that Jesus used about himself all through his earthly ministry. And this is where we find it. And we believe Jesus brought this out of the Old Testament and, and then applied it to himself. The term Son of Man is, means that Jesus was, was the God-man. He was God who left heaven. He took on a, an earthly body. Uh, he was made in the likeness of man in order to redeem us. So when we see that term, when Jesus uses the term for himself, son of man, he's saying he's God who became man in order to redeem us. He is the Messiah, is another way of stating that. Now we come to verse 15, and uh, we have the interpretation, and some of it we've already shared with you, but let's look at it. Remember, Daniel's had this vision. It's during the time of Belshazzar. Uh, it's 50 years after Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, 
And in verse 15, he says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. He's overwhelmed by this. And I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me, and he made me to know the interpretation of the things. Verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arrive out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever and ever. So that would, that fits, if you'll look up here, that fits what we're seeing uh, in, in this vision. The stone smashes everything, the stone fills the earth, and then God's people will serve him in the millennium, in Christ's kingdom. And so this is described here where God's people then uh, are uh, in power during Christ's kingdom. So that is, it's, it's skipping to the end. All these kingdoms are overthrown and, and God's people uh, possess the kingdom. Verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. See, so he's talked about all of them, but that fourth beast, this one that is so uh, unlike regular beasts. You know, the other ones were, were like something we recognize. That fourth one doesn't resemble anything in, in the, the animal kingdom. And so let's continue on. Verse 19, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beasts, beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured break in pieces and stamp the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things or very braggingly uh, focused things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, far more intimidating than the rest. Verse 21, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. There's a lot of repetition here, but he's building the case of what's going to happen. Verse 25, and he shall speak great words against God, against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, a time, times, and a dividing of time. Uh, this is a term that we're going to see in here, and it's also in the book of Revelation. And some of you know this, but a, a time would be a year. Times would be two years. And a dividing of time would be a half of year. So a time plus two would be three and then a half. Three and a half years. Now when we go into Revelation, we know that the tribulation period is a total of seven years. But we know that halfway through, there is what we call the man of sin or, or the Antichrist is, is in power. He's going to befriend God's people in the first three and a half years. In the second half of the three and a half years, he is going to show who he really is. And for those last three and a half years, um, it's going to be terrible. And so what did it say? So what we're looking at here, we aren't going to do it tonight. We're going to watch how it's tied to Revelation. 
But notice um, in verse 25 again, it says, He will wear out the saints of the Most High. God's people are going to be under intense persecution from Him, and He is going to try to actually be God. And He is going to try, it says, to change times and laws. And we don't know what all that means, but He is going to want to, to change everything. He's going to make it His. Um, will He change the number of days in a week? In other words, he's going to say, I declare that there are 10 days in a week. I, I declare that there are not 12 months. There are 15. And in other words, he is going to say, I'm controlling everything. Um, but it says, look at the end of verse 25, that, that most difficult time when he's going to wear out the saints make it very difficult for them. They're going to be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. That three and a half years of, of terrible persecution. Verse 26, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion. In other words, God is going to overthrow this man of sin, uh, this antichrist, this all-powerful one, um, and he is going to lose his authority and to consume and to destroy it unto the end. He is going to ultimately be defeated by God. Verse 27, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. In other words, this terrible time this focus in, in our passage, this three and a half years that will be absolutely terrible, that's going to come to an end and then God's kingdom is going to be set up and God's people are going to rule in His kingdom. Verse 28, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed in me but I kept the matter in my heart. In other words, at, the, at this point, he's just working on it himself. He doesn't quite know what to make of all of it. It's very overwhelming. I know that he knows that it's, it's, it's linked with, tied to what, what God had revealed to Nebuchadnezzar, and yet there's far more to this. And so what, I, what I'm going to, to show you then is um, let's look at it like this if, this, if this works better for you. Chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision had Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greece, Rome, kingdom of God. What we are looking at tonight, only with different animals, you had, you had Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greece, Rome, kingdom of God. When we come to chapter 8, just so that you know what we're going to see, chapter 8 is going to get focused. And it's going to dial in on Greece. We're going to dial in on that. In chapter 9, we're going to look at, you've probably heard about it, 70 weeks. Chapter 10, there's an angel that's going to come and talk to Daniel. Chapter 11, then, the focus is going to be on Greece and Rome. And then chapter 12 is going to be on Rome and then the eternal state and when we talk about the kingdom of God. So that's how all of this fits together. If that's helpful to you to sort of say, man, I'm just overwhelmed. But if this lets you kind of see, that's how this stuff breaks down. It's going to, some of these, these next chapters are going to just kind of zoom in on certain things that we have already looked at in chapter 7. So I hope that is helpful to you and... Uh, this is pretty heavy stuff, uh, but, but this is what God wanted Daniel to know about the future. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us your word. And Lord, some things are kind of hard to understand. And, and it's fascinating as we look at uh, Daniel being told about what was coming um, kingdoms that we 
have already seen in history, uh, and these were perfectly fulfilled. Other things that we're starting to look at tonight that are coming in the future, we believe has not been fulfilled yet, um, and we look forward to that. And then ultimately, Lord, when you set up your kingdom, and by God's grace, when we will get to be a part of that and participate in it. In Christ's name we pray, amen.